All right, what's good, everyone? Gazale Orella here with a new episode of the Komuku Podcast. Um, this is the final day of the bond climate week, uh, weeks actually, negotiations um, under the end of Topo C. And yeah, thought I'd yeah thought I'd spend a little bit of uh, time, a um, couple of minutes, probably turn into a half an hour. I don't know. Danger. It's way more than that into some reflections um, of what transpired over the last couple of days um, in terms of negotiations, where we are. Um, thought I'd share a little bit about the background of yeah, the negotiations, what made us bring to uh, Bonn, um, what we're trying to achieve, and yeah, what, what, we, what we found in Bonn um, also think it will also be good to, to highlight a little bit about like the, the, the technicalities the inner dynamics um, and also like what what are the main takeaways so the things that we um, yeah should be thinking about as in these peoples um, yeah leading up to COP27 which will be held in Sharm El Sheikh Egypt um, at the end of the year um, in November and yeah what we actually should be gearing up for for the yeah, uh, the, the climate summit happens every year. Um, it rotates. So last year was in Glasgow and uh, there's some videos about that uh, as well. And um, so you uh, don't have to rely just on this video but or on this episode, but um, there's a lot more where that came from. So uh, please subscribe as always. Uh, would help me a lot to get the message through to other people and um yeah well basically that's it um in terms of in terms of the, the introduction of it all this is the gomaluku podcast when when we arrived in bonn obviously the facilitative work group was like the three days prior to um yeah when the subsidiary bodies were um um, yeah, we're, we're scheduled with the facilitator working group, but I won't go into that. There's another video on that uh, a conversation I had with uh, Johnson Cerda um, from, from Ecuador um, that goes into that. But in Bonn, what we expected was that it would set the stage for COP. Um, it would do some prep work for COP. Um, what we usually experience in, um, when, in these climate negotiations is that um, yeah, bond is the technical work, COP is the, um, yeah, the, will be the political work, um, the political decisions will be made. Um, that is the most of what we, what we, yeah, what we experience, what we, um, what we understand from the, from the entire process. And yeah, this this particular session was was no different. Um, it's all about setting the stage, creating the agen creating the agenda, um, trying to get as much headway, uh, um, get as much content as uh, as possible, and then um, yeah, wait for uh, and then send that to 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 Egypt, and let Egypt iron out the yeah the final issues that they need to deal with. Um, so that was what we expected um, within, in Bonn. So for us, um, particularly on Article 6 and loss and damage, so we created a hybrid group, um, a team of the, of the Indigenous Caucus that would deal both with Article 6 as well as loss and damage. And I'll get into that, why we do that a little bit later. Um, this, what we did was, sorry, the intent of the team in Bonn working on Article 6 and Loss of Damage was to lay some groundwork. So do, do some, yeah, do some initial contact, initial conversations that would add up towards, um, yeah, some good conversations, directions, uh, mandates for the COP. So, with uh, quite a number of states we didn't have any contact with. Um, and so prior to arriving in Bonn, like I sent out like almost like 50 emails 
to um, yeah to party representatives and and, and parties um, like yeah uh, with different um, how I should have put it um, yeah wording uh, contexts you know like it's 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 all like tailored towards the the party that you're trying to reach almost like 50 um, yeah emails I've sent out and it's like a volume game so like if you send out 50 um, only I don't know if you're lucky like 20 will uh, will read it or open it and then 10 will respond and actually five will uh, set up a meeting with you like that, that's that's how my calculation was so volume game you send up a uh, send out a large amount of emails and see what um, how it is received by 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 parties um, because it was this whole exercise, at least the back end of it, um, in addition to negotiations, influencing the, the conversation, was to get good relationships with, um, yeah, with the negotiators, with the experts, with the um, the people that, yeah, can make a difference in the negotiations. Um, leading up to COP, so doing like the, the bulk of the technical work, but also like with those that are making the decisions. Uh, the heads of delegations, uh, the lead negotiators. You want to sit down with them uh, so that they have just have some face time, so that they know they're in a in a in a distant memory. Um, they know they have spoken to you with any of these peoples, and that you create a seed, you just water it throughout the year or throughout the remainder of the year, because COP is only like four months away. Um, that you, um, yeah start that start the process right um so there's some good relationships well with with these negotiators lead negotiators with the cyber that, that that was that was the main angle um then you 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 land in bond and you you real not realize um you see the lay of the land because you can you can um prepare as much as you want in terms of agenda wise assumption wise I think that that's the most important one. You because you assume before you land in bond, you assume a lot of, of things, but it comes um, down to actual yeah going into yeah into these conversations, into um, meeting with people, civil society, the human rights working group, uh, friendly states. You sit down with them and you yeah you, you check the temperature, like what's going on, like what are your what are your priorities, what are you focused on. There's a lot, a lot of intelligence in there, in these, in these, uh, in these conversations. So that is, that is uh, why, yeah, like you have always have to check your assumptions that are based on the agenda. What you read on the UNFCCC website, what you read in news articles, which I absolutely almost don't do, often never do, because it's, yeah, the news that you read in, uh, in, in those. Um, yeah, news articles is very different from the from the information that you get from um, yeah from from these negotiators from these from these uh, government representatives. That one, all right. So good relationships with with lead negotiators uh, with negotiators. Do some capacity building on loss and damage as well. Um, when we did the um, yeah the preparatory meeting. Uh, for indigenous peoples, which is usually the day before the meeting starts, which is usually on a Sunday. Um, I did a presentation on Article 6 and as well as loss and damage. And we, I, yeah, I, I just saw or felt, I observed actually that the amount of knowledge on Article 6 was way more than the amount of knowledge that, that the caucus collectively had on loss and damage in terms of the agenda, in terms of the negotiations, uh, where things are. Um, so, the, the, so I realized that we need to do some capacity building on loss and damage, which is also, an, which also influenced the, or, or strategy. Article six is, is simple. Like uh, we, we've been in that for for a couple of well, a couple of years now, and when it comes to 
that we're, we're very intimate in the process. Not as intimate as we wanted to, but we're very intimate and we are very much aware of where things are, what, what the playing field is, where the negotiation landscape, how it looks like that, um, pre-detailed. Pre Lots of damage, not so much. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's different. Um, which also, yeah, inf influenced our um, the way that we, uh, yeah, worked on the consolidation of our views or position on the issues of, yeah, Article Six and as, as well as as, as well as loss and damage. It it brought up a that we had to change, well, we had to pivot. Actually, that does that does well, that's what it was. We had to pivot from a position paper um, which we usually write um, to a advocacy paper why a position paper um, a position paper um, it was super helpful like i said if you have good con connections with good conversation with member states with party representatives they'll tell you very frankly what works and what doesn't work quite a number of them um, told me uh, bilateral, not bilaterally, just like informally, just when we're texting WhatsApp or in the corridors when we have a conversation, they said, well, yeah, your one, uh, one page position paper strategy worked. Not only that, um, and I think that is the, 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 like the key conventions of a position paper, uh, because when it comes to position paper, you wanna do, you wanna have three things. One is that it's one page. One page. Um, um, don't do like, like so. Don't don't think about. Oh, I I need two pages now. Like, force yourself to create a one-page position paper. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you in a bit why. The second convention that you need really need to take, need to take into account is that you need to have like surgical recommendations. Like, all right, for example, when it comes to textual textual negotiations, where do you want to see the change, and what do you want the change to be? Those are super important. Um, no, like, like, like blanket or abstract, um, yeah, recommendations. But like, just a textual negotiations. Delete these words, replace them with these, and that's what we want to see. Um, and the third uh, uh, convention that you need to keep in mind is always put your name and your phone number, um, or and or email address on on the document. Here's why. And here's why it all comes together. When you send out a position paper or you give out a position paper and it's one page, um, people can take a photo of it or it's easier to, yeah, to spread it because they can just like take a photo and this, this is what I've seen. We print it out and, 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 and we go to these meetings, uh, to these bilateral meetings, these negotiations. We print, print it out, and give one or we show one and everyone takes a photo because it directly, immediately, it is digital. So take a photo and they send it on into what their WhatsApp groups, the internal negotiating, uh, coordinating groups. Um, so there's one page. So you have in one page, so it's easier to, to spread, to distribute. Second, um, if you're surgical in your, in your recommendations, in, in what you want, the change that you want to see, um, it's easier for them to incorporate that. There have been negotiations. Um, or there's, um, in Glasgow, there were uh, uh, some of our minimum standards or some of our priorities, which was in the position paper, was carried by a a record breaking number of, of, of parties because it was, so, it was so clear and some parties knew like all right this is the bottom line of indigenous peoples this is the, what they want to see like this is um yeah this is the, the minimum like, so we need to make sure that it's in the text so the, the the usual suspects the usual the classical supporters of indigenous peoples when it comes to parties like they knew like all right this is what we need uh to include in the text and it was super helpful. The third part is, is, yeah, put your name, phone number, and email. But nowadays, it's, it's WhatsApp that, that like rules the world, especially when it comes to negotiation landscape. WhatsApp rules the world. Um, so put your name and phone number on, on it. And so 
during the negotiation, during the last two weeks, with parties that I didn't know of, uh, or they didn't know me, um, I, I've got a, like, so many party representatives, negotiators, they send me a text like, hey, um, saw your position paper, can we have a quick cup of coffee, or can, can we have a quick chat? That is what you want. You want the the conversation. You want you want the, the relationship to be built. Um, so that's the one page position paper um, that that worked. It, it worked in Glasgow, and it continues to work over here in in Bonn, and hopefully will also continue to work when we're in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. Um, because like the first thing that you want to do is set up these informal meetings. Um, this uh, yeah. Usually it's with staffers, with staff people, which is which is fine because you want to escalate. You want to then to reference up the conversation, um, and yet what eventually what you want is to go into a bilateral meeting. So in formal meetings, it's like, hey, let's grab a cup of coffee and or a frozen yogurt, which is super popular over here in, in Bonn. Um, I almost had a daily uh, cup of uh, frozen yogurt with with friends and, and party delegates. Um, you do that. That's the starting point. And then it is like, hey, um, let's talk for five minutes. Um, and then, oh, let me connect you with our lead negotiator. Or let me send, uh, if you have a document, please let me uh, um, send it to me so that I can send it to my lead negotiator. Or which all adds up to like, oh, you know what? Um, let us sit down like informally. So like there's no textual negotiation, whatever, informally and discuss like the priorities of indigenous peoples and my party, that's, that's what they usually say. And that's where you want to go to. Like, and then it is super important to, yeah, uh, um, that you also go into a, you don't go into a, what we call them bilateral on a whim. You don't go into a bilateral unprepared. Um, so this, this is, here's what happens in bilaterals with, with, with countries. Um, sorry, before we go into bilateral with a country, we go into bilateral, what I call bilateral prep. So let's say we have a, a bilateral meeting, so in the, uh, yeah, bilateral meeting with the country at 2 p.m. I schedule within our WhatsApp group dedicated to, to Article 6 and, and loss and damage, I schedule a bilateral prep meeting. Um, one hour in advance, or maybe like an hour and a half in advance, so you have like one hour to prep and then 30 minutes to like to relax or make your way to the meeting where you the room where you're about to have the meeting. Um, what you do in bilateral prep is all right. What is the the, the spiel, the routine that we're going to use? What uh, um, what are you going to say? What are you going to what is so in our bilateral prep? What is Kim going to say? What is Susanna going to say? What is Savanto going to say? Um, Alberto, um, Pablo, like like, everyone has a role into into this, into in, in this bilateral. We also uh, talk about all right, who is going to talk, who is going to listen, and who's going to watch. Oh, sorry, so who's going to talk, who is going to watch, and who's going to write. Um, granted, like the writing part is something that we we, we were lacking um, most of the meetings. But it is important that you also do distribute that, um, yeah, those uh, yeah, elements of, of, uh, of participating in a negotiation or a bilateral. And here's why. As a t so I'm a team leader. Uh, so usually there's a heads of delegation. Um, so for example, if we have a meeting with the um, Asian countries, for example, um, our heads of delegation, head of delegation will be a representative from the Asia caucus and so that will be the, the yeah, our facilitator kind of way and who will give the introduction and then hand it over to the the, the experts so the, the 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 team leader which is myself if we have if we talk, we're going to talk about article 6 and loss and damage if it is a negotiation on climate justice or cl uh, climate finance for example climate finance I'm not the team leader on that. It would go to either Helen or Eileen. Um, but on Article Six, loss and damage, I'm the team leader. So um, the the yeah the, the head of delegation from Indigenous people will go, then go to, 
hand it over to me. I'll give the bird's eye view. All right, all right, here's where we got uh, from Glasgow. This, this is what we achieved in Glasgow. And and then, then uh, uh, what, are, what our priorities are in, um, in Bonn. And then I say, well, um, hand it over to other people um, to, yeah, to go more into context and, or, and um, explain a little bit more. But the most important part is, when it comes to these bilaterals, is not to like vent. It's not to like, all right, this, now is my time to, to convince these parties. That's not, what you, no, that's not the goal of these negotiations, of bilaterals, sorry. The goal of these bilaterals is to get as much intelligence as you, as you can. So ask questions. It is to can become smarter. The, 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 the challenge for indigenous peoples is, is that we don't have access to most of the negotiation. We don't have to have access to the negotiation nego uh, when negotiations happen outside of the plenary room, uh, outside of the public meetings. Uh, we don't have access to the, the negotiations and to, those inf to the information. So, so you set up meetings with all these parties and you, what you try to do is you gather as much in intelligence as possible. So how do you get intelligence? Is by asking questions. Is by asking not just random questions, but calibrated questions. Calibrated questions are questions that you answer in such a way, or sorry, that you calibrate questions or questions that you formulate and deliver in such a way that the one, the person that you ask the question to is, yeah, like feels, yeah, how should I put it? Like feels, yeah, that he, he or she needs to answer the question because he wants to answer the question. So those are the, the, the calibrated questions. And does a meeting or a bilateral, um, how long does it take? Ideally, a bilateral meeting takes no longer than 45 minutes. Um, I, yeah, it should take no longer than 45 minutes. And for us, it is super important that you go into like brass tacks as soon as possible. As in like going to the like where, why did you get into that meeting? Why did you organize that meeting? Um, so, it's duh, duh, duh. we usually do have like a round of introductions, uh, heads of delegation, and uh, gives the late overview, then hands it off to uh, to the the um, yeah the lead negotiator or the, the the team leader. That gives the the context, and then you go into brass tacks meeting, a little bit of context or or background and and questions, lots of questions. And then you put it back to the to the to the parties. All right, let's let's see how they respond and what they what they come back with. And so that is in short what happens in bilateral. So it's no photo op. Um, it is not like trying to pressure, and it's also not going into those meetings aggressive. You should never go into these meetings um, um, with aggressive tone. It's always you want something from them. And they know that they're sitting on, yeah, this this metaphorical pot of gold. So it is up to you, like, to, to yeah, to, to realize that and know that if you go in guns blazing, that you won't get something out of that, um, out of that conversation. And again, it is about creating a relationship that you want to build because when it comes to when you need them, that they will trust you and that they will say like, oh, well, we'll, we'll do what we need to do for you. Um, and you won't get that if you like, from the get go, that you like jump, almost, almost want to say jump to conclusions, but like you jump into like aggressive mode. Um, another, so inf intelligence uh, is important, uh, gathering when it comes to bilaterals. Another important element or why in terms of bilaterals, is when you see there's a shift in the landscape. I felt a great disturbance in the force. For example, Australia. Australia has a new government. How, yeah, how does that affect or impact, or how, is, how does that affect their foreign policy? And how that, in fact, impact the rights of Indian peoples? How does that impact our work? So, um, we set up a conversation with, with, with Australia, new government, 
um, it's more progressive. So yeah, you go into that conversation and yeah, um, um, you check where they are. And um, the good thing is because the planning is happening right now upstairs and because of the conversation that we had and uh, because of the good relationship that we had and Dwayne Fraser, very good guy, um, is uh, indigenous, Abri Aboriginal indigenous from Australia, sorry, indigenous Aboriginal from, from Australia and did a lot of good like lobbying work um, and got us, yeah, that meeting with Australia and as well as a meeting with, yeah, with the Umbrella Group because of it. Um, good relationships, uh, good conversations led to, that's why I referenced the plenary, the, the main the plenary of the final plenary, as they men mentioned in their three minute statement, the importance of indigenous, indigenous people's participation in their statement. Uh, so they have like three minutes to yeah to to deliver every every state or group has the opportunity to deliver a uh, yeah the reflections for three minutes. So that if you're mentioned in those three minutes, that's that's a golf shot. That's that's gold. Especially if that if you're mentioned in a in a, in a in a yeah speech uh, of a negotiating group. For so, for example, Umbrella Group is is a group that includes Australia, Canada, uh, uh, United States, Japan, Kazakhstan, like uh, not quite a number of countries. When I mention the importance of Indigenous people's participation in their plenary statement, that means that we got into the text, and something had to get out of the text. You know, so. Imagine like what the the the, um, the deliberation internally and how important they deemed to to mention that Indigenous peoples need to be uh, yeah, included or the participation of Indigenous peoples is key in climate um, yeah discussions. That is all built on yeah on, on these conversations that you have that that you're building these relationships. Had the, so one of the, the lead negotiators, Kate, Kate Hancock, is she so she co-facilitates the uh, negotiations on Article Six Point Four. I had a brief conversation with her, so like, and I, when I introduced her, myself to her, like, oh, Gazali Horella, I'm from Maluku. She's like, oh, Maluku. I went to a, on a holiday to Maluku. Like, oh, great. So where did you get, where did you go? Well, she went to Ambon, Banda, like, like many places. I'm like, cool. And all of a sudden, you, suddenly you have to rapport. You have this conversation that you're going. And see, she, and so we, we spoke a little bit in, uh, in, yeah, in. Well, she spoke in uh, in Bahasa Indonesia, but I replied in, yeah, in my, um, yeah, in Bahasa Ambon. And every time you 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 see each other, like it's, it's this point of recognition. Ah, she knows I'm from Maluku because we spoke and because she we had this. And I know that she went to Ambon, she went to Banda, you know, like, so those, that's, that's, um, yeah, it all, it can start with those simple conversations. Another reason why we go into uh, to, uh, these, uh, these conversations is, for example, Costa Rica, new government, just like Australia, but uh, Costa Rica is a fairly different kind of government. Um, so yeah, we're wondering. All right, what? You know, yeah, is do you still have the same kind of approach? Do you have the still approach to inter to foreign policy, to the principles uh, um, of yeah uh, uh, human rights and et cetera, et cetera? Uh, so you want to have have that conversation as well. So it's to yeah to to get intelligence, but also to check in. All right, where are you, new government? Are you still uh, if it's positive, are you, or, or sorry, if it's negative, are you uh, still, um, yeah, pursuing the principles? Are you st still in line with the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples? It's that, or if it's positive, it's like, all right, so, well, what can we expect from your from your government? So that that's a super super uh, super interesting, and that's what you try to do like the whole time throughout the, the two weeks. So. Even though this today is the last day, so before the plenary started, we had our last bilateral meeting or informal bilateral meeting, um, because yeah, it's it's not about it's not about bond. 
is about comp. So you're building towards comp. And comp is just also like it's like a milestone, but like you, you need to put that into like the larger um, um, context of larger climate action, the goals uh, until 2025, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what you want to, want to um, yeah, how you need to see the timeline. Um, yeah, so that's something that we, uh, in terms of bilateral, and we also have to, like meetings with, with the, the COP presidency, uh, the previous and incoming. Uh, so the previous is uh, Alex Sharma from, from the UK. Incoming is um, yeah the COP president from uh, Egypt. High level dignitaries. Um, most of those meetings I'm not in, involved in because yeah, I already have enough on my plate in terms of Article Six and loss and damage. Um, but it's also like you also have people that come to our meeting, our daily coordination meeting, every every day in the morning from 9 to 10, and these people meet uh, to coordinate um, yeah, the, the events of the day. And some, from time to time, we have guests to our meeting. So because this is the last yeah, um, um, bond climate week, climate negotiation week for Patricia Espinosa, the executive secretary of the UNFCCC, she came to our meeting um, and yeah, was she, she received a uh, um, yeah a, a nice card with all the uh, yeah like uh, messages of, of thanks uh, from the caucus and and uh, and uh, yeah and flowers and the photo of, of uh, her with the Indian caucus um, today uh, at in Bonn. Um, so Bonn was also in like a, like a, the last hurrah kind of thing for, for uh, Patricia Espinosa. Um, 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 she. A uh, little bit of um, tribute to her is that she was always willing to meet with indigenous peoples, engage with indigenous peoples, receive indigenous peoples, and yeah, like it's the contrary to other uh, high-level dignitaries within the UN system, um, UN Secretary General, the current UN Secretary General, uh, the current uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, have not, to my knowledge. Um, had a like a meeting with indigenous peoples um, yet so they haven't but she has you know so it, it is um, something that um, yeah like you can really like commend uh, uh, Madame Espinosa for doing that she went to the Pacific you know like there was she went to many uh, meetings that, that were held in the Pacific um, yeah just to um, not only to advocate for the the, the, the work of the Unitopal Sea, but also to see firsthand with their own eyes like the effects of climate change uh, on indigenous peoples and in, indigenous nations in the Pacific. Yeah, Madam uh, Espinosa, thank you so much for, for your work, for your dedication, um, and also for taking the opportunity to also visit our islands, visit our region. Uh, we've seen you in our region and we're very much appreciative of that. And uh, we uh, wish you well on your continued journey. Thanks so much. I remember that there was one meeting, the, I think it was the Polynesian, uh, yeah, Polynesian Islands uh, meeting that she, I, she arrived on a plane that I, um, yeah, that I used to get out of Tuvalu. Like, so that meeting was held in Tuvalu in 20, 2018. She arrived and I left on a plane. So like she, yeah, she's, uh, she's very, she's very engaged and very much looking forward to, to see like where she, where she shows up in the, in the future. Um, there was even a call by, by the caucus like to, well, maybe she should be um, next secretary general. Who knows? High Commissioner for Human Rights is, uh, is vacant um, as we just now learned. So maybe that is an idea, who knows? So that's a little background. Well, let's go into like the the yeah the the gist of it, like the into the details of it. Um, so I'm I'm going to stick to Article Six and loss and damage. Stock tick was on the table as well here. Um, uh, climate finance, cl sorry, climate finance, agriculture. Uh, there were quite a number of issues that were on the table. However. I'm, a, I'm, I'm focused on Article 6 and loss and damage, um, so I'll, I'll definitely like, yeah, I'll only focus on these two issues. So Article 6, let me, let me, let me kick off with that one. Um, what we did in, in, in Glasgow, 
we came out strong and which was um, acknowledged by a number of uh, member states or parties when we met them uh, they they knew like wow did in these peoples when they, when we come out of Glasgow we came out strong and by strong like, succinct coordinated um, very surgical almost like a was somewhat over uh, one um, representative of a party or someone like it's almost like the Navy SEALs um, how how well organized we came out in in Glasgow um, that's a compliment that that's a, a super compliment for a yeah for a caucus that uh, is very diverse lots of diverging views as well um, getting to a consensus is is, is a challenge but it's, it's desired um, position paper developing um, coordinating it's, it's super um, yeah super um, super challenging however to get the receive the compliment from a party representative is um, yeah again it's like a golf shot it's like great um, so we did that in, in, in Glasgow so yeah you set the bar and the only thing you can do after you set the bar is to meet it so we were pushing and we need to keep pushing so we kept pushing um, we have claimed a seat at the table in article 6 and I'm not gonna rehash the whole thing but in article 6 we've been able to operationalize the rights of rights of indigenous peoples and human rights so in a way we have claimed our seat at the table and we have claimed our position of, um, of yeah, within Article 6.2, 6.4, and 6.8 of, of the, the uh, Paris rule book. Now that we are reflected in the text, it is up to us, and not up to, up, up to the parties, but up to us to make sure to, yeah, to make sure that we stay included, uh, we, that we continue to push, that we, I said it right after um, Glasgow, Article 6 is not done yet. Um, if you put it parallel to the platform, the platform was established in the Paris Agreement, but it needs to be operationalized. And that took uh, four years to operationalize the platform. The Article 6 is now established. It is now, it has now the the, the hands that feed it needs, you know, it has the, the, the guidelines, the rules that it needs to uh, to be implemented. But now you need to operationalize and implement it, you know. So that's why I that's why I said, you know, like Article Six, we're not done yet. We're definitely not done yet. Um. Uh, so that that's our, our vantage point. It is that, and also that we're not. Even though we don't like it, most of us don't like Article 6 and in terms of the market mechanism. There's a lot of Indian people see it as a false solution um, that got us into this mess. Um, fair point. Um, but it is happening. And you can bitch and moan like as much as you want and, and denounce it as much as you want, but it is happening. So you do that, bitch and moan and about it, or you can actually try to make sure that it ha what is done the right way so that is something like the like the the the, the state of mind you need to, or the mindset you need to be in to yeah the, to yeah to, at least how i see it to engage in these conversations when it comes to article six um that it's they, they see it as most of us most of these people see it as a false solution um that got us into this mess but you can also argue in addition to that, like science, science got into us in, in, into this mess as well. Um, so, how do you deal with that? Um, however, um, I, I won't go too deep into that. What I wanted to say, uh, what I wanted to stick with, is that our vantage point is that it needs to happen the right way, because there are indigenous peoples out there that want to participate in this market mechanism. Um, so that with the proceeds of, of this market mechanism, um, they can, you know, like they, they can fund their own projects on sustainable development or, or other things, you know. So that is, 
that is why it's it's not from the international perspective i believe not in our interest to denounce it but actually to make sure that's our interest to make sure that it happens right the right way 6.2 so you have 6.2 6.4 6.8 um 6.2 is focused on international cooperation um how parties or countries can help each other with yeah meeting the um yeah the their goals in their national determined contributions or ndcs and what we're trying to figure out right now is a a transparent process um and accurate accounting of the emission reductions if they are achieved you know so that that there's no um yeah how should i put it yeah in all markets or in in budgeting or financing like you need to be super ac accurate in, in, in it same thing with these carbon credits or itmos um that you need to have like strict rules when it comes to the accounting of these um yeah of of these carbon credits um and from our indigenous people's point of view like the the quality of credits is super important and what i mean by quality of credits is that these credits can only be provided if the project that was done to receive the um the credits um or the circumstances that um it was in line with human rights and the rights of indigenous peoples so that's what we mean with the with with the quality of credits like we kept we kept keep a very high standard of it and we want to maintain that high standard um all right so 6.4 um i'm not going to deep into it into it uh what we wanted is well 6.4 is these is the sustainable development mechanism the the uh what's it called the this supervisory body that's going to be uh yeah operationalized we already have the human rights safeguards in there and it's up to us to make sure that it trickles down into the yeah into the work of the, the guidelines the processes and uh, the procedures of the supervisory body um, when it comes to the design and implementation of these emission reduction activities but also when it comes sorry when it comes to design, I need to elaborate a little bit further on that. So a design and implementation of the emission reduction activities, which is a, a um, yeah, an, an important element of the um, negotiations or one of the priorities that we didn't get um, in activity design, paragraph 31, um, it calls for a consultation. So when it, before a, a, a project is uh, yeah, in the design of the project, consultation needs to take place with stakeholders, and, and which includes indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, from the indigenous people's perspective, it was super important that the consultation happens in line with the Declaration on, Rise, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, me, and particularly free prior form consent. Which is, if you look at the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it's an international standard. And what we got into the text was domestic arrangements. So you have the international standards and domestic arrangements. Which one do you like? Well, we like this and we don't like this. Because domestic arrangements, um, yeah, it could be everything, anything. Um, so international standards was for us super important. Uh, to be included, we didn't get that. Ideally, we want to have international standards, comma or like the Declaration of Rights of Peoples, in particular, fight free plan from consent. We didn't get that. It was a huge fight. It was a huge fight, intergovernmental, um, and a lot of parties around the table said, "This is the best that we can get out of it," at least in Glasgow. All right, fine, um, but we didn't get what we wanted. What the uh, 644 further does and what, what we are looking at is the yeah the verification of um, yeah the results achieved um, sorry not the verification of the results but also verification of 
the activities. So another uh, something that's another thing that we wanted to have included in the um, yeah in the rules or the guidelines or procedures of 6.4 when it comes to supervisory body is uh, an independent grievance mechanism. We didn't get that. We did. We did get, got a independent grievance process because we want the front end. We not want to have free power from consent when it comes to consultation, but also when something happens and we want to have something on the back end, uh, like a grievance mechanism. Um, this ideally, if let's say if a, a project what would happen on our on our uh, on our lands, we weren't happy with it. Doesn't didn't occur with in line with consultation or free prime from consent and not in line with declaration of rights of indigenous peoples, that a community could go to that grievance mechanism and could, yeah, like, like file a grievance and that a result of it could be that the credits that were, that were, um, yeah, that were uh, rewarded to that, that, um, that party, would not add up to the NDCs or would not even uh, would be revoked in a way. Ideally, that is what we see. And again, it goes to the quality of the credits. So that the credits uh, would be revoked if, or not being provided or rewarded if the project would not be in line with the Declaration on, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, so that's what we wanted to, to look at. So when it comes to credits, um, again, it's, uh, the sustainable development mechanism is a is a yeah is a new version of the clean development mechanism, which was under the Kyoto Protocol. This was this one is on the Paris Agreement. Um, there are countries that have credits remaining from uh, from the Kyoto Protocol. So one of these things that they um, negotiated in Glasgow was a carryover. It is the, the the credits that you had under the Kyoto Protocol that you can bring them into uh, the sustainable development mechanism. Um, long, long debate on it. Um, there was a loophole created, obviously, um, that um, yeah, credits that are from the CDM, that are registered, because all these credits need to be registered so that it adds up to, uh, to the NDCs. Um, so the credits are registered after January 1st, 2013, they may be used for the NDCs of a, of a party, uh, of a country, um, but only used for the first cycle of NDCs because countries need to like incrementally, every number of years, they need to, um, they need to yeah, set up a um, yeah, an, um, list of goals, of targets or NDCs. So this is the first cycle. So they can only take, bring their uh, CDM credits um, that they have registered after 2013 and take after that, take into account for the first cycle of NDCs. Um, so that is a loophole and not everyone is uh, in, in agreement with it, but that is something that, that um, I can imagine that that, that was a, um, yeah, uh, um, an outcome of a negotiation that was necessary to keep everyone yeah, happy, um, amongst parties at least. And these peoples, not so happy. Civil society, not so happy. Um, that is so that, that's what's at the table right now on the 6.8 which is non-market approaches um, we did see that that's um, a lot of countries are they're, they're super interested in the market approach of it so 6.2 and 6.4 because there's money involved there's incentives involved 6.8 is like the purest form the noblest form of international cooperation um, the non-market approach and apparently and this is the, the fun part of it. Apparently, um, parties don't know. Uh, some parties don't know how to um, engage in non-market approaches when it comes to international cooperation to reduce emissions or mitigate emissions. So, um, because they don't know, 6.8 was supposed to be finalized in Glasgow. Um, they couldn't come to an agreement. So what they did, well, you know what? Let's do a set of workshops um, to be organized over a no X number of years so that we can figure out what um, yeah, non-market approach is. It's like a capacity building thing. Workshops, uh, uh, um, informal notes that will inform the workshops, technical papers um, by, by experts, etc., etc. 
it's a usual tactic. This is a tactic we see across the board. It's when a decision is not uh, is taken that is not satis satisfactory, um, then it, yeah, sorry. If an outcome is not, sorry, I should rephrase that. If an outcome is, sorry, if a decision tax includes an outcome that a number of parties do not like, they either, you know, the best way to do it, to maintain like, um, yeah, that, that nobody goes crazy or nobody gets mad, it's to say, you know what? Well, we won't go into a decision text, but we will go into like a capacity building workshop sequence series to, and then to finally come up at, at the end of it with, all right, we have something um, that uh, we can agree with. So it's like, it's a tactic. It's a tactic that we, that we that's uh, our strategy, whatever you want to call it, that is being used time and time again. Um, so that was that. That's um, what we're seeing right now on non-market approaches. Is that we'll we'll see an informal notes, and we've been doing a lot of work to yeah to get our yeah in these people's in there um, in the decision text that in these people's rights are in there. Um, so that it bec because it becomes a basis for the yeah the rest of the year um, yeah and the process in terms of non-market approaches. Um, so that was super important to, yeah, to, to advocate for that as well. Um, from our, our point of view, when it comes to these non-market approaches and um, these informals, is that we have, we can participate in these informal uh, workshops or processes that, are, that, that will occur from now until COP. Um, too often, what we have seen is that indigenous peoples, after after bond, they fly home and go into hibernation, and then two weeks before COP starts, people wake up and all right, yeah, all right, what's on the table? That's unacceptable right now, because and I'll tell you in a bit why. Um, that is um, also that's unacceptable also because we've raise the bar, we raise the standard. So at this point, the only thing you can do when you when you raise the bar, when you raise the standard, the only thing you can do right now is to meet it. Um, all right, so so what um, I talked about quality of, yeah, I talked about quality of uh, credits. In these bilateral meetings, I have also talked about um, sustainable, sustainable development, Rights of Indigenous peoples, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it's all under the umbrella of UNFCCC. Outside of UNFCCC, I have also uh, conversations on market mechanisms because that will, because it's built into the 6.4 uh, rules that can that it can also be informed by entities, mechanisms, processes that are outside of the UNFCCC. So shopping around, you look around, and then you and you start to create a, um, a relationship with a new entity that's the International Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets. I had a conversation a couple of months ago while working on, um, on Article 6, and what they're about to, to release is a, is a, yeah, it's just a very higher standard of, uh, of, of credits, actually. So in these conversations that I have with bilateral meetings, in the, in the bilateral meetings is that is, is that a race one ICPCM. So many parties around the table, like what the hell is ICPCM? So they look at their, so, so when the, I, in one bilateral, um, I raised it and the heads of the delegation looked at their point person, like, all right, take take down what he just, what he just said. And we need to know what, what the hell ICBCM is. And why don't we know, why do, do any of these people know more about it than we do? Um, I raise it because it's an incentive. It's an incentive when it comes to any of these people that are holding a high standard, wanting a better quality of credits that, to, to flag, well, is the UN about to have like lower standards that are mandatory than the ICBCM 
which is voluntary and where a lot of these parties around the table uh, negotiators are engaging with the ICBCM you know so that's what you bring to the table uh, so that you um, know that that, that the UNFCCC is about to create a standard that's lower than a standard that, that that's, that's voluntary and that's also all everything that we want to bring forward in this intersectional work of article 6 and that's why engaging in this intersectional work of article 6 is important and intersectional work are your workshops are these 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 events that are being organized um, yeah to advance the discussions the negotiations on on article 6 and on 6.2 6.4 6.8 they, they all have workshops we will yeah, we as and these peoples have plenty of things on our plate for the next couple of uh, couple of months and just to flag cop 27 is only a couple of months away it's four months away so that's on article 6 right loss and damage um, like I said before on loss and damage we <laughs> we uh, we need to become more engaged and more smarter in it uh, we just now had a um, yeah at a, at a strategy meeting the road to cop 27 in terms of article 6 and loss and damage and I spoke to um, Susanna from the Sami council um, lead, myself leading article 6 and loss and damage right now possible not preferable but it's possible um, as things will get more tricky more complex I asked her to take the lead on loss and damage um, we st will still have hybrid team meetings on loss and damage and article 6 and I'll explain a little bit why um, but we do need to have like point persons that are like experts on article 6 and loss and damage I'll focus fully on article 6 no problem um, but in the so I asked Susanna to, to, yeah, to take the lead on, on loss and damage for now. Like, as, as long as you want it, it's yours. Um, because I felt that we were not smart enough. We're not, yeah, uh, we are not experts enough in loss and damage, even though, like, it is it's a super important issue to us. So, um, so we changed our position paper to an advocacy paper. We wanted to work on a position paper, but we felt the need like there's there's nothing that we can actually really pinpoint and advocate for. Again, the three conventions of the of the position paper um, that I that I shared um, a while before. Um, when it comes to the loss and damage, we we included an in advocacy paper. One loss and damage right now is super narrow, and what when we talk about loss and damage, we we. When we listen to the discussion on loss and damage, it's super narrow, and in our view, like it needs to be narrow because of broader. Sorry, it needs to be become much broader because right now we're only talking about loss and damage, but we're not talking about the aversion of loss and damage. So loss and damage should cover the aversion of loss and damage as well, not just yeah uh, when it happens or when it happened, but also making sure that it doesn't happen. Um, Another important issue is okay, like loss and damage is is uh, under loss and damage is or if yeah information intelligence that informs loss and damage is IPCC the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. IPCC in its latest reports, um, for one, it mentioned indigenous peoples or indigenous rights one four hundred and eighty nine times. That's a lot. Um, but also, it made a important reference to colonization because it said that colonization um, was and continues to be a driver of climate change. So basically, it said actually what Indian peoples have been saying all for all all along, and long before the IPCC mentioned it, because the first IPCC report was released I think 30 years ago. Um, so long before that, we said like colonization is 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 one of the biggest problem of everything. It's a root cause of everything. Um, so that's what the IPCC said, and it's right now when we we, we 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 bring it forward in these bilateral meetings, like hey, colonization is a problem, like, and we've been saying it, but now IPCC IPCC says it, says it well. And it says that the rights of Indian peoples is important. So the termination of Indian peoples is important to make sure that it's, yeah, that to 
yeah, to, to, to mitigate climate change, climate change, to make sure that in these peoples, the, uh, you know, like the, the stat that you hear everywhere, like 80, protecting 80% of the world's remaining of biodiversity, that you help them do what they do best, which is, and helping them is to, yeah, to um, protect their rights. So that's what's a super important thing that we brought forward is the IPCC mentioning colonization. Um, maladaptation was super important as well. That we also brought into conversations. Maladaptation, like there's a lot of talk about adaptation, right? Uh, you need to adapt to climate change and like sustainable development projects um, like under Article 6. But what you do see when it comes to mal is in terms of adaptation projects or processes or, or, or when they're implemented, you see the adverse effect of it. Particularly, indigenous people see the adverse effect of it. So for example, um, maladaptation is when a, when you build a wind turbine in, in, in so this is, what, this is what, what Susanna said, raised a lot, is what, when you win, wind turbines in Samuland in Northern Scandinavia, um, that because it's far away from, from the general public, so like nobody, uh, nobody's view is contaminated, quote unquote. Um, but it does affect the livelihoods of indigenous peoples. It does affect the livelihoods of the yeah of, of the animals around it. The adverse effect, for example, of mal which 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 we call maladaptation adaptation is, is that you you build a, a wind turbine and the. For example, the main, main source of nutrition for these, uh, in these people, so the main source of income for these people are reindeer, when it comes to Sami, for example. And they, they go away. But the community that lives in that area, uh, yeah, like it relies on the animals that live in that area. So when the area, when the, when the animals move away, the community is left with nothing. So you can put that into the context of islands. Put it in the context of the Pacific Islands, for example. If you look at, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Samoa, Tuvalu, or or uh, Fiji, for example. Let's say uh, in, in Samoa, like the main source of income of uh, of, of the Pacific Small Islands is is fishery, right? Tuna, for example. If that is main, your main source of income and your main source of yeah, and you, you try to maintain your biodiversity sustainably, and that's what indigenous people do. Like they don't like have those super trawlers to um, to fish on on tuna, but they do it sustainably to make sure there's balance, there's regulation. Um, what what would happen if the area where they usually fish fish a I don't know a a offshore wind turbine uh, park is built? The, and the tuna will move, move away. So this, the, the people of Samoa will have to go further uh, into the ocean or further, yeah, further into the ocean to fish on a, on, on a, on a tuna. The people of Samoa, they cannot move. They're, Samoa is their land. Samoa is their, are their islands. So they can, say, like pick up their island and move um, further where the, where, the, where the people are or where the, where the fish are. So that is like the... the it creates a domino effect because if you cannot stay in your area and, and and because you have to move because of your main source of nutrition is moving is migrating as well you cannot take you can no longer take care of the land and you know, there's so many things that and again 80 percent of world's remaining biodiversity on lands of indigenous peoples it creates a tickle down like a domino effect that that has adverse effect on Loss and damage, right? Like it, it, so it becomes worse. So maladaptation is something that we need to, yeah, need to be very, yeah, need to be have become a more uh, robust. No, not robust. Um, yeah, they need to be more included included into into the conversation. But just like non-economic loss and damage. Right now, it's under Wim, Wim XCOM. There's a special uh, um, committee for that. But when it comes to non-economic loss and damage, which is like culture, language, um, things that cannot, that cannot be, yeah, uh, 
you cannot touch but it's actually part of yeah it's part of a society um, that's long non-economic loss and damage though so it needs to be have which is particularly important for indigenous peoples and uh, small island developing states or small island, small nations that needs to be uh, included into the conversation from indigenous people's point of view what's interesting or what we talk about is the relationship between loss and damage and article 6. article 6 is a money-making mechanism loss and damage costs money so how do you link the two in a way that um, because loss and damage right now like it relies on pledges you know like like, like so uh, there's a facility loss and damage facility that that's that's being discussed um but it all relies but it's almost like funding like you have to like rely on pledges from from developing country of developed countries so that you as a developing country can yeah can address your loss and damage the other thing is from these people's point of view is we're not included in loss and damage however we're on the front lines of things so we should be included into into the whole conversation the other thing is is that in these peoples are very are the best to in the best place yeah in the best place, in, as not only as figures or speech but literally to assist the decision making process um, as, at the global level when it comes to yeah loss and damage policy because we're there at the, at the uh, on the coastlines in the mountains in the deserts everywhere we're, we're there so um, we can help signal um, yeah the impacts of climate change and the potential impacts of loss and damage doesn't cost you any money uh, well you don't need to have like fancy equipment for that but if you don't you have like in these peoples to do it and in these peoples have been living there for since time memorial so they they know like their lands like the back of their hand you know so it's very important that you include in these peoples in the decision making processes on loss and damage but also include them in the yeah financing financing part or the support part of loss and damage like the santiago network or the finance facility um so that's so um let me let me cut it short or let me not cut it short but like finalize this whole thing now so i talked about the background of things um of 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 why we're here in Bonn, the auto six negotiations um loss and damage and i could go, go talk about that more um but I think, uh, yeah, something get my yeah get my head head more around it, um, gather my thoughts, like, um, and then and then do do another um, yeah video or yeah podcast on this. Um, all right, so so let, let's talk about what's next. Um, obviously, cop. Which is, um, I have never seen a, a so unified concern by parties, constituencies, indigenous peoples, and civil society. Never seen that before. Uh, because if you look on, go online, and you and you try to f uh, find a book a hotel in Sharm El Sheikh or Airbnb, and you'll see that the, the prices are like insanely high. Um, so usually, well, I don't know, like what what a normal room would be like around 50 to 100 euros. Now, like these resorts are uh, have the <laughs> audacity to um, yeah to ask for like 400 euros plus. You know, so that's what we what we're what we're looking at. So like parties have actually raised it in in their meetings um, uh, with the COP presidency, the incoming COP presidency, or just. But also like alluding to it like well um it also has to something to do with the timeline if you talk, look up the article six uh, uh workshops they were they're talking about like do we do like inter intercessional or pre-sessional pre-sessional is like you know, that you'd go a few days before comp that you that you uh, go to uh go to some shake but it only costs more so they're like well um prefer not to the pre-cop uh, pre-sessional because it's super expensive they actually said that in a yeah online in a meeting um, so 
that that's accommodation is is a is something that that's um, yeah we all as the Indian peoples are are yeah um, super aware of on the, that we're um, trying to figure out like all right how are we how in the hell are we going to do that that um, preparation obviously uh, like I said hibernation is no yeah we can't do that that anymore we cannot afford um to hibernate anymore uh so because there's a lot of preparation to, to do just on article six and loss and damage alone on article six we have 10 weeks 10 weeks um to prepare submissions on 6264 6264 68 um and they all have a deadline on august 31st so not only do we they had to add, articulate crystal clear like how we see this whole article 6 thing develop how what, what we see it but also how we yeah how we look at the landscape and how we look at the and how we answer the questions that are, that are um, um, or the topics that are, for, that are being discussed in the informal dialogues on 642, 648, that, and yeah, how we write it down in a submission. And then we have to lobby. So we have, we have 10 weeks to uh, to do that. So we can no longer afford to, yeah, to, 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 to sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Another point is we've started these conversations and one of our, yeah, uh, one of our priorities is to continue these conversations so what we do is um, yeah start this conversation and we'll continue like check in with with, with, with parties with governments um, yeah to talk about the um, what is it? the the work leading up to COP um, the work at COP um, blind spots all these things are something that we uh, yeah are we going to are going to, to talk about well, um, during um, yeah, the remaining months between now and, and Egypt. Um, so that is um, in <laughs> in um, uh, one hour and a little bit more a brief reflection of, of, of Article 6 on loss and damage, the work that we do here in Bonn. And yeah, I, I think I should, um, yeah, should go back up now because any these peoples are um, soon, hopefully, we'll be able to address the, the plenary, the closed plenary. Our new co-chair will be addressing it in, in Spanish. And I'd love to be there to, to witness it. Right. Have a great day and thank you so much. See ya. My friends, I hope you enjoyed this. Please consider to subscribe, to comment, and to share this video on your socials.